Greetings, programs. My name is Wretch, and I'd like to welcome you to Vampire the Masquerade Night Road. So, uh, we're jumping into something a little bit different than what we're used to. Um, I played some of the interactive fiction, such as Coteries of New York. I'm currently playing Shadows of New York. But this is, um, this is a hardcore, like, interactive fiction novel set within the world of darkness. And it's been highly recommended by several viewers that I should check it out. So, um, yeah, we've got some ambient music in the background, which is from VTM Bloodlines. And we're just going to go ahead and check this out and see what we have. Like, I started the game up, and it's just this screen right here, starting at Chapter 1. Uh, we have the ability to show stats. By the way, this is done by Kyle, Kyle Marquis. So, um, looking forward to this. Now, in terms of stats, we don't know what clan we are yet. Um, we've got a 1 in Strength, a 1 in Dex, a 1 in Stamina, Ugh. a 1 in Charisma, 1 in Manipulation, 1 in Composure, 3 in Intelligence, 1 in Wits, and 1 in Resolve. So normally we have the starting dots that a, a, a starting VTM character would have. The 3 in Intelligence is debatable, if you've uh, watched any of my Let's Plays. We've got 1 in Drive, got nothing... Oh, excuse me, we've got one in Academics. We're clear on everything else. And then nothing in the Disciplines. So the Disciplines right now, based on 5th edition, we've got Animalism, Auspex, Blood Sorcery, Celerity, Dominate, Fortitude, Obfuscate, Potence, Presence, and Protean. So, this should be fun. Let's go ahead and get started. Arizona, I-10 heading west, night of November 1st. Sunrise, 6.41 a.m. You're getting ready to pass a diesel Mercedes when the shifter goes all loose. You jiggle the stick and pump the clutch, but it's like holding a dead man's hand. Your old Honda drifts off the highway in a cloud of sand and grit. A moment later, the engine stalls. You pop the hood and fumble around in the back for a flashlight. Then you realize that it's getting light out. You can feel that this poor car, your companion for ten lonely years, is finished. And if you're still out here when the desert sun rises, so are you. Cars fall apart. So do people. So do phones. You pull out your old iPhone and check the time in the cracked screen. 6.05 a.m. Unlike your poor Honda or the tattered air freshener hanging from your mirror, which used to hide the smell of dried blood, You'll last forever, if you can find somewhere to hide before 6.41 a.m. You've been making these courier, courier runs for ten years, each year making less than the last, hiding in trunks and storage units during the day, racing down the desert highways at night with messages and parcels in your passenger seat. It's been boring. It's felt like getting old, trapped in this body that can never age. Well, you're not bored now. You're even breathing again short and frightened little breaths as you watch the sky lighten in the east. Nerves you thought extinguished years ago fire up again, making your hand shake. You feel almost alive as you check under the hood. The cable clutch is fucked. No surprise there. Maintenance hasn't been a possibility, let alone a priority. And when you look at the engine, you realize the problems run deeper than one busted cable. You've been ignoring the warning signs, like an old man who keeps coughing and won't go to the doctor. And the engine looks like... The engine looks like you're going to look in exactly... Check your phone again. 16 minutes. Maybe there's still time. You look around at the dusty highway, the wasteland that stretches out to the black horizon in every direction, and try to recall your mortal life. Something you learned when you still drew breath must have the power to save you here. So, um, we were told that we need to go ahead um, and turn on the stat check indicator, also known as storyteller mode. So we're going to go ahead and do that first. Storyteller mode tells you which attributes and skills are used in a check. This makes the game easier and also simulates the experience of the Vampire the Masquerade tabletop game, where the storyteller explains what stats you will check. Storyteller mode also notes the relevant stats, not modifiers due to equipment, previous checks, and distraction caused by your terrible hunger. You can turn off storyteller mode in the stats page. You look around at the dusty highway. Oh, okay, here we go. Hmm. 
So let's see. I grew up poor working on cars. I had lots of mortal friends and I've kept in touch with some. I served in the military. I've got a good education and I haven't let my knowledge stagnate now that I'm dead. I have a feeling what we're going to play. So I think we're going to go ahead and get this for, take this option. I use my phone and some maps to figure out where to go. There are lots of maps in the glove compartment. And though your data connection out here is terrible, you don't use GPS because you don't want to be tracked. You just need to see the maps. From then, you might be able to cobble together a picture of where you are and figure out which way to run. In your life, you got a business degree and learned how to act like you come from money, tried to get through community college with the help of the Army Reserve, ran out of money, but at least you learned to shoot. Uh, supposed to study ecology in the Everglades, but you spent two years just wading through swamps racking up debt. Pursued a criminology degree, paying my way by chasing down bail skippers until I ran out of money. And you studied computer science, dropped out and discovered how good you were with computer crime. So out of all of these, I like... I'm like the community college with the help of the Army Reserve or the criminology degree. Hmm. Which one do you guys think? Kath, you like the criminology one? Yeah, I'm kind of leaning toward that one too. It kind of shows that doggedly pursuing things, you know? Let's go for this one. I pursued a criminology degree, paying my way by chasing down bail skippers until I ran out of money. Some days it felt like you were more of a criminal than the people you investigated. And looking back now, it's clear you were being exploited when you were too young and eager to realize it. But you certainly learned to swindle the swindlers and turn the tables on... It doesn't matter now. You're going to burn unless you do something. You grab the satchel holding your deliveries and abandon the Honda to rot on the side of the highway. You kick the trash on the side of the road, looking for anything useful, and find only flattened cans and scraps of paper. You cross the road, try again, and uncover an old speed limit sign. It says 20 miles per hour. That's not a highway. It might have come from an industrial park or a now abandoned housing subdivision. With the sky lightning, you know you have no choice. You run south, leaping over scrubs and rocks until you spot the black hulk of an abandoned building on the horizon. Shelter. The stars to the east are gone, replaced by a blue-purple haze. It's 6.30 a.m. You remember the last time you saw the sun. You were so focused in those days. Life was so clear. You knew what you were going to become. And then... You were out of college and looking for work spending all day on your laptop or making calls. You had a job at a call center, another job at an olive garden. You did some design work, but you were drowning in debt, desperate to pull all of your education to work. You remember your last day well. You drove to your call center job, found it boarded up, and a bunch of confused assholes just like you standing around outside, not knowing what to do. It was around six, so you watched the sunset illuminate the grimy low rises and the cash for gold signs before shrugging and getting back into your car. It wouldn't start. And so you got out and started wandering around with your phone up, looking for a signal. And that's when a shadow detached itself from beneath your car. When you rose again, burning with hunger and sticky with your own blood, killer did not call you kindred, or canite, or vampire. First, you learned about your clan, your lineage, a bloodline that existed since before history, before all cities except one. Your killer said you belonged to... So, um, here's where this, this is where it gets interesting. We can choose the Ventru, the Tremere, the Toreador, the Gangrel, the Bruja, the Banu Huakim, um, who, if you played any of the previous editions, these are the Asimites. And then we have the one without a clan, one of the Caitiff. So, I think it is time for some Tremere magic. 
It's been a while. Clan Tremere, scholars, conspirators, and blood sorcerers. The usurpers of Clan Tremere are said to descend from a mortal wizard who stole a mortal life from an ancient vampire. Once organized into a disciplined arcane hierarchy, the sorcerers of Clan Tremere are in tur turmoil after the destruction of their greatest occult stronghold. Disciplines, Auspex, Blood Sorcery, Dominate. Though famous for their thaumaturgy, their intricate sorcerer's tradition, many Tremere also possess supernaturally acute senses and the power to command mortals with a word. Clan Weakness, Frail Blood. This manifests in different ways for different usurpers. Some mend their flesh slowly, Others cannot form blood bonds or create ghoul servitors. In the um, previous editions, they were actually more susceptible to dominate. So. But here we go. Yeah, that Montross was the name of the of the Tremere character from the Bloodlines playthrough. Spot on. I am Clan Tremere. Long ago, a hidden society of wizards sought more power and mastery. They wanted immortality, or more than power and mastery. The head of their order, a wizard named Tremere, thought he had found it in the blood of an ancient vampire. Tremere thought he knew the price he would pay. But though the Elder's blood granted Tremere and his followers eternal life, it also destroyed their magic. As wizards, they had shaped reality with will alone, as a sculptor shapes wet clay. But vampires are not artists. They're corpses. And the magic of Clan Tremere was dead but they still had their iron will and their urge for mastery and with what they survived into the modern and with that they survived into the modern nights each tremere loyal to the one above in an invincible pyramid of obedience and secrecy and then the pyramid shattered and your sire the sorceress scientist in yeah, nvidia call stuffed a bunch of trash bags full of arcane marvels and hoofed it out of new york leaving you behind half trained and beset by enemies before she left, she gave you vision and purpose. You were... So we've got her apprentice, an occultist in life. Her head of scientific occult research. A philosopher of blood sorcery. A seer, oracle, and supernatural security expert. Her enforcer and get whatever she wants specialist. I think that actually fits, especially if he, she, or if my character was a bail um, officer for a good portion of the time. I think that fits. What do you guys think? Yeah, definitely fits. The wet work specialist. Her enforcer and get whatever she wants specialist. Tremere are not usually warriors, but I carried a blade and a deadly stare that left my enemies quaking. The pyramid of Clan Tremere is heavy with intellectuals and philosophers. A rude person might say it's full of nerds. Despite her iconoclasm and techno magical approach to the blood sorcery of her clan, Nvidia Call was like many blood witches, focused on academic pursuits and high culture for all her thirst for blood. And when the pyramid granted her permission to embrace a child, she did not want an apprentice, another meticulous and thoughtful scholar of thaumaturgy. She wanted someone actually useful. And she found you. Tough, fearless, comfortable in a fight. You knew how to survive and thrive on the streets. Actually, hold on one second, because I think I may have... Oh, wow, okay, our stats have gone up, which is awesome. Streetwise investigation. No, I think we're still good. You knew how to survive and thrive on the streets. The first thing NVIDIA taught you was that mortals weren't worth much. She beat you handedly, killed you, and explained what happened after your embrace. But then she made her pitch. She needed someone to guard her interests and acquire assets for her research. You weren't going to be a sorcerer, at least not yet. Instead, NVIDIA would teach you how to control minds and give you a sword. 
and a list of criminal societies who fenced arcane paraphernalia. Those were the best few years of your life. Armed with your blade, your burning gaze, and your deep knowledge of New York streets, you tore through alchemy dens, tong-affiliated occult shops, and long-buried heretical churches, recovering arcane treasures for Clan Tremere. Your mental powers soon expanded to such a degree that NVIDIA, frustrated by the stodgy magic of the pyramid, started to consider teaching you the real secrets of her art. She just needed a few more arcane treasures to begin your lessons in thaumaturgy, so you left to find them. When you returned, NVIDIA was gone. She sent you a warning, though, and you escaped the kill team five minutes before they arrived to burn your sire Chantry to ash. It took you weeks to figure out what had happened, but eventually you learned the awful truth. Hunters had destroyed the Vienna Chantry, the greatest arcane fortress of your clan. The pyramid was broken, and now the Second Inquisition was burning its way across the United States. And you were barely a Tremere, just a street fighter with a handful of arcane secrets. You pawned your occult treasures to get out of New York, bought a car, and made your escape. Tremere clan disciplines. Auspex, blood sorcery, dominate. Uh, frail blood. You cannot mend injuries quickly enough to repair yourself in combat. Usurpers need to plan ahead when expecting violence. Uh, I think we're playing like one of the worst builds, to tell you the truth. And after all that, ten years on these miserable desert highways scraping by on the charity of your elders as you run their errands. You've lost your edge, the clarity of your focus, sacrificing specialization in order to learn trick after trick, in order to survive from night to night. If you were still alive, you'd be middle-aged. The elders of the kindred are lies wrapped in flesh. Undeath is no promise of immortality. You've seen a hundred canites born into the night only to die a few months later at the hands of hunters or their own kind. Or just because they didn't know what time it was. Strange that you're going to die young. The air ripples and smells like burning metal. You should never should have bought that hatchback. Ahead of you is a long abandoned field. Now let's actually look at our stats proper. So we have a sword right now with a two strength Charisma, Manipulation, Composure, Intelligence, Wits, and Resolve. Um, combat 1, Drive 1, Intimidation, Leadership, Streetwise is 2, Academics is 2, Investigation is 2. We've got 1 in Dominate. So, this should be interesting. Ahead of you is a long abandoned filling station. Its sign faded into illegible... Er, <laughs> illegibility and its windows boarded up. Your mental powers are useless here alone. Though the station looks abandoned, you see footprints in the sand. A golden eagle sits on the stripped diesel dispenser, watching you with unsettling intensity. You approach the main building, looking for a way in. The windows and doors are all boarded up, and though there's a garage door for a loading dock, it seems locked. The eagle spreads its wings and screams. You don't have time for this. The sun will kill you, but first it will drive you mad. You can feel the beast rising in you. The beast. The untamed monster that looks inside every vampire. That drives you to acts of depravity and violence. You're losing control. You need to act now, but that eagle seems almost to have been put here to guard this place. Its talons flex. Okay, so there's more stuff. Hmm. Mental domination and inhumanly keen senses. Learned a bit of blood sorcery. Mental powers have been honed to a major command. Even this eagle? Oh, so that would give us animalism. I assume. Let's go ahead and learn a little bit of the blood sorcery. We'll say that he, she, before pawning them off, we learned a little bit of the basics. Your battered jacket is full of occult paraphernalia for performing the rituals you know, and running your fingers over them offers comfort even as you feel the beast rising within you, threatening to drive you mad. But there's no ritual you can perform quickly enough. You pull out a heavily modified Kindle loaded with Picatrix and related grimoires, 
a folding knife you had planned to enchant with Asimite death magic, a silver flask intended for a Tremere ritual, covered in scratchy Greek letters. The eagle's eye snapped the flask. In that moment, you realize this creature is no common beast. It is a famulus, a servant of the blood. The kindred of Clan Gangrel love their hellhounds and ghoul ravens, though this one... Yes, it understands what you're holding. How can a famulus recognize an artifact of Tremere blood sorcery? Right now, who cares? This might be your only chance. You wave the silver flask one more time, then hurl it away from you. The eagle flies past you to retrieve the half-finished artifact. Without the distraction of the eagle, you're able to move quickly around the abandoned station. You run to the north side, which will buy you a few more seconds before the light destroys you. And there you find a single open window. As smoke starts to escape from your clothes, you wiggle inside, then crawl kick away from the hole. A wave of exhaustion hits you as the sun rises fully. The kindred were not meant to remain awake during daylight hours, and you look around for anywhere safe you might rest. There's an old metal-topped freezer beside a counter here, just big enough to hold you and sealed against sunlight. Itching around the shafts of daylight that filter through the open window and the gaps in the boards, you wrench the old freezer open. It smells like expired milk, but you can't worry about that now. We're about to pull uh, Indiana Jones from that one movie that shall not be named. You drop into the old freezer and pull the lid shut. Then you mentally inventory all the things you do not need to worry about. Your ruined car, or you do need to worry about. Your ruined car, the ache of hunger in your gums, the smell of fresh blood somewhere in this building, the strange eagle. You may not survive another night, but you survived this one. You survived the fall of the pyramid and the disappearance of your sire, Nvidia Call. You survived out here in the desert for years, one night at a time. You permit yourself a tight little smile. You can still make it. You can still find a way out of this. And then the blackness of the day sleep swallows you. Arizona, I-10 heading west. Night of November 2nd, 6.42 a.m. If anyone had found you that day in the disused freezer, they would see only a disheveled corpse. And while the sun is in the sky, that's all you are. The blood you got back in El Paso before you hopped in your Honda awakens the moment the blood sets. The return to consciousness is instantaneous and agonizing. You open your eyes in blackness. Your limbs are still heavy, as if crushed by the weight of the sun. As you wait, you think about the Camarilla, or Camarilla, and you remember what the elders made you do after Nvidia Call disappeared. You were desperate then, and you knew you had to obey. They paired you with another desperate young canine, a charming young man named Julian Sim who talked too much. He was something that other kindred called an Asimite, and back then you didn't know if it was another clan like the Tremere or another sect like the Camarilla. No one ever bothered to tell you, and that right there is one of the craziest things about 5th edition, is that the Tremere and the Asimites are actually cooperating in the same sect. Like back in 3rd edition, that would have been an absolute no-no. Julian had the eager energy of a congressional page and the glittering patient eyes of a reptile. He was out for himself, and so were you, and that gave you something in common. You remember Julian's lime green geo tracker crunching to a halt over gravel. You jumped out and felt the sand beneath your feet, still hot hours after sunset, though the night air felt cool. Julian was well dressed despite the rough work, but back then you always wore the same thing when you were out in the desert coveralls with the name you use sewn on a patch. Not your real name, of course. That person died in a strip mall parking lot. You still call yourself... Okay, we can do it. Next. Those old coveralls let you pass as a maintenance worker just about anywhere. They were better prote protection from prying eyes than any Nosferatu's invisibility arts. 
Carrying water for the ivory tower, eh, wretch? Julian said with a little chuckle, hoisting the plastic gallon jugs out of the back of the tracker. Each read, Bueno suerte or, suerte, or something like it in blue sharpie. You didn't laugh. This wasn't humanitarian work. Or maybe it was. The desert, the desert princes still fear the thing that slept under those sands. They told you that if it woke up hungry, it would tear this land apart. How long do you think we're going to do this? Julian asked. Julian talked too much, but sometimes he cut through the bullshit with words that carried a constellation of meanings. How long? Decades? Centuries? We, neonates, nothing but larvae in the eyes of their elders, and this, this awful work. Well, you're supposed to be the visionary, Julian. Give me a reason to walk away and I will. <laughs> you already know all the reasons. Julian said. This work will destroy us one way or another. We need money, wretch. That's the ugly truth. All my brilliance and all of your lesser but still adequate intelligence won't help us if we don't have a couple thousand bucks and some convincing IDs, will it? But if we can get that, just that, we can get away from all of this. I'll even buy a new car and let you keep the tracker. But we need money. A hot desert wind whipped Julian's black hair around his head as he counted the gallons of water. The Camarilla gave you a job they considered necessary, even vital. Desperate migrants stumbled through this part of the desert, fleeing violence in Mexico and Central America for the promise of a better life in the States. Without water, many died. Aid groups dropped water and supplies for the migrants. The year before, the Camarilla had infiltrated and supplanted one of those aid groups replacing their, num their members with you and Julian. Your job? Position the water above the scattered layers of the Nosferatu Elder, the one known as Raremaus. The victims he claimed would give him enough blood to prevent his full awakening. Oh, this sucks, Julian said as you checked the GPS coordinates on your Garam, or Garman. I mean, I know what we are, I know what we do to survive, but this is just, just so, so stupid. It's inefficient and wasteful. This was how the world ran two or three centuries ago, wretch, before anyone invented flowcharts or assembly lines. Hmm. So. Need to kind of think about Oh, that is a very true mirror. Yeah, I like that, Kath. They were just food. Why care? It needed to get done, and maybe the smart ones knew enough to escape. You shrugged and did what had to be done. The moment you understood what you had become, you knew you would have had to make certain sacrifices in order to maintain your undead existence. Like Julian, you eschewed, or eschewed pointless cruelty, struggled to control the beast within you, but unlike Julian, you tried not to lie to yourself. So that night, you checked your position on the Garmin one last time, dropped off the water, and got back in Julian's geo tracker. A few months later, Julian got his money though you never learned how. Something to do with venture capital interested in the software he was developing? Anyway, one night he just disappeared, leaving you with the Geo Tracker, a stack of CDs with file names written on them in blue Sharpie, and instructions to deliver them to an industrial park in Austin. You looked up his new company, 2100X, which was apparently located in Denver, but you could never find an address or a contact number. And that's been your life ever since. You can move your hands now. You push the top of the freezer open, haul yourself out, and drop silently to the ground. Your hunger is an ache in the back of your gums that leads right up behind your eyes and threatens to turn into a migraine. You can hold off the beast a few more nights like this, but you'll need to feed soon. 
You wander past dusty and empty shelves and glance outside through gaps in the boarded up windows. You can't see that strange eagle, but you still smell blood. It's faded, but impossible to ignore. Movement catches your eye, but it's just your reflection in the broken glass of an empty display case. You stare into the eyes of a haunted looking, eternally young man. You look like shit. Bloodshot eyes, skin pulled back from your nails and teeth, thrift store clothes. Even your satchel looks like someone dragged it down a highway. You check the satchel. Your deliveries, the USBs, are still in there. Then you hear a sound outside. A few whispered words in Spanish, weeping. Thank God. Food. They must have pulled some boards away to get inside, then covered them up so no one from the road spots their flashlight. You're in the middle of the disused convenience store's three aisles, invisible in the darkness. At the far side of the store, a short hallway leads to three doors. A locked bathroom straight ahead and then two doors, one to the left and one to the right. You guess the left door leads to a storage room. The mortals are trying to get it open. You count four of them. A man and a woman in their mid-twenties, an ancient woman, and a frail and gray-haired older man, even smaller than the old woman. The younger woman whispers something in Spanish you don't catch, then forces the storage room open with a shriek of metal. Not much here, the young man says, sweeping the storage room with his flashlight. He's traveling heavy. Crowbar, backpack, water bottles, road flares. Those are your road flares. They must have found your Honda. Whoever they are, they're foolish or desperate to bring a woman in her 70s, at least, and a guy who isn't built for this kind of work. You're surprised that they're this far north without having already made contact with someone. The younger woman starts jiggling the handle to the bathroom, which is between the storage room and the office. Bored and fearless, the old man hobbles down one of the aisles. And your beast screams behind your eyes. Hmm. So... Sneak up on him and drain what I need before anyone knows what happens. I just need to take the edge off. Should be strong enough to grab the old guy without him making a sound. Not going to risk a snatch and grab turn into a massacre. Hmm. I'm going to go ahead and observe. There's too many of them and I'm not taking any risks. I stick to the shadows and watch. If you were still alive, you'd be around that age when death no longer seemed like something you can avoid forever if you're smart and lucky. People your age see a friend die young or lose their parents and start to realize there's no trick that will let them go on forever. But you're not alive. You can go on forever, if you're careful. And that means knowing when to take a risk and when to stick to the shadows. You wait. So you have an excellent view when the young woman finally gets the bathroom door open and the thing inside bites down on her face. Uh, no, it's not like that in, uh, okay, well, we got traits now. All right, we have a humanity of four, our hunger's at three, which is bad. Run, we have, we had three masquerade violations. We've got inventory, a journal. Wow. All right, so there was another, uh, <laughs> another resident in here. The woman manages half a scream. The old man turns and sees the mutilated corpse dangling from those huge jaws and moans in horror. The thing holding the corpse hurls it toward the old man, missing you by inches and splattering your face with blood, and both the corpse and the old guy go down. You absently note that the woman's corpse is already drained of blood. Then you turn and confront the thing in the bathroom. The kindred of Clan Nosferatu are never beautiful, but this one is particularly hideous. Stark naked and so tall he has to stoop to get out of the room, with a flattened skull and huge bat-like ears that make it impossible to imagine what he looked like in life. 
and then you look into his flat black eyes and realize there's nothing there. April 2007 In the end, we're weaker than they are, Julian says, watching a trio of teenagers across the 7-Eleven parking lot. He sips blood from his extreme gulp, then uses the gesture at the mortals. I mean, spiritually, we're weaker. We're like scurvy victims or something. We can't heal. The beast, you say. I'm not going to ask you what you've done in its grip, Julian says or what you've done on your own and blame the beast for, but I know the beast will eat you if you're not careful. It'll eat your soul and live behind your eyes. When that happens to one of us, the Camarilla call them whites and hunt them down. And the Asimites, you ask? T I don't know, I've never had the courage to ask. The Nosferatu, the mindless right, had once been a Nosferatu, spots you. Is it white or right? I've heard it say either ways, actually. Depends where you are in the world. All right. I w I'm just going to call them rights because that's where I put this from Tolkien. But then it turns, and though you cannot see the tough-looking young guy and the old woman, you know that they're cornered in the storage room. As the dead woman's blood runs down its chin, the creature weighs its options. It turns toward the storage room, moving awkwardly because a huge iron chain is fastened around one of its legs. Then something lashes out of the darkness and the right reels back, more in surprise than pain. The young man strikes the creature again with his crowbar. That won't be enough to fend off a monster like this. These people will be dead in moments, and then the fallen Nosferatu will turn its mindless rage on you. Hmm. So let's look at our stats here. Uh, charisma, manipulation, our intelligence and whatnot is definitely our best options. Uh, intellectual. So that's going to give us six dice. Or we can use dominate if we want to. The problem is with dominate, if the vampire is a stronger blood potency than we are. Then we are... Oh, we're 11th gen. Ooh. Well, if we use Dominate, that's also a... Uh, could be a Masquerade Breach. And we don't know what we're going to do with these folks right now. Let's go ahead and take the tactical approach and see if that works out for us. You know what I mean? There must be another way out. Using my knowledge of how this place should be laid out, I look for a way to get us to safety. You can't get around the right to reach the window you call, crawled through, and you don't have time to smash through a board, but you must be able to think this through and find another way out. Then you remember the garage door for the loading dock. That eagle prevented you from approaching it last night, and it was probably locked from the outside, but you visualized the shape of this building and realized that the door must be in the storage room. The garage door, you shout, trying out your Spanish, though you haven't spoken it for a few years. You grab the unconscious old man, you doubt they'll flee without him, and dart around the right as it struggles with the chain. The younger man stares at you in confusion, so you just hand him the old guy and look around. There's the door. You yank it open and wave them through just as the fallen Nosferatu rushes you. Its dirty fingernails are an inch from your face when the chain catches again, yanking it to a halt. You lock gazes for a moment, then you slam the door down. It locks with a satisfying click. It's his place now, the old woman says, watching the shadow of the Nosferatu as it shambles through the abandoned convenience store. She says something else in an indigenous language that you don't understand. 
her hands gripped tight around her crucifix. Then she grabs the young man's shoulder before he goes back for the dead woman. His shoulder is hurt and he has a cut on his scalp. The crucifix doesn't move you, but you do get away from the blood. The old guy moans and the two of them help him stand on his own. You have a thousand questions and one problem. Where did the Nosferatu come from? Who chained it up? Was it imprisoned because it had become a right, or did it lose its mind during its imprisonment? And what are you going to do with these people who just saw a blood-stained, bad-eared monster kill a woman? Hmm. What's our charisma? Yeah, I think Dominate is definitely to the rescue here. That's going to potentially get our uh, food going, though. Hmm. Yeah, let's see what happens here. Most of your mental powers are limited in scope and duration. You could get someone to back away, give you something, drop a weapon, but you lack the power to inflict long-term changes in behavior or belief. There is one exception. The first thing NVIDIA's call taught you to do with your dark gifts is to scorch the synapses of the human brain. Stolen blood flows into your tongue and behind your eyes as you catch the gaze of the young man. A single word shocks him into forgetting the details of what just happened. As he blinks in confusion, you turn your attention to the elders, dazzling each of them in turn. You're not sure exactly what they'll remember of that horrific encounter, how their brains will rebuild the experience to cover up the hole in their memories. A savage animal? Attacked by one of the state's racist militia groups? It doesn't matter. They've forgotten what they needed to forget. They stumble away to the north. Confused and harmless. You check your iPhone. It's broken. You take out the SIM card and destroy it. Then destroy the spares you carry. You wear a watch because sunrise is never far from your mind, and yet, that's broken too. You check your satchel, but the USBs are all there. All safe. And then the hunger hits you like a punch in the stomach. You've burned too much Vitae, fueling your powers, and now only scraps of blood remain in your veins, but there's nothing you can do. You can hear the right in the empty convenience store, snuffling and moaning. You walk back to where you left your car, but it's gone except for a single hubcap. You check your reflection. There's blood on your hands and face and clumps of gore in your hair, and your shirt and jeans are in tatters. You have nothing to wash with, but you rub sand all over yourself to try and get it as much of the blood off as you can. You look like something that just crawled out of the earth for revenge. You can't show yourself anywhere civilized like this. Headlights appear on the highway and you fade back into the scrub. Instinctively, you check the satchel one more time, but everything's there. Everything that just happened was a distraction. Someone else's problem. You can reach the outskirts of Tucson before dawn and from there make your way to the new prince's court. Just deliver these USBs and you'll make enough money for a new car. You'll be able to keep doing this. Night after night. You start walking. Chapter 3, The Eagle Prince. Yep, need, need food. Food. Tucson, Arizona. Night of November 2nd, sunrise at 6.42 a.m. Your feet hurt. You already passed the place you were supposed to stay yesterday, but it's just an empty garage. There's nothing there for you. An hour before dawn, you reach the chain link fences and industrial parks that mark the outskirts of Tucson. You can see cheap stucco houses up ahead, and the burbs are no place for a vampire. Without a cell phone or money, with your clothes too trashed for polite company, you revert to skills you honed in the desperate years after the fall of the pyramid. 
When you find an abandoned semi-trailer in a factory parking lot, you know that the high walls should keep the worst of the heat off. You check it for holes in the ceiling. Finding none, you crawl inside. You spend the day with your brain screaming in terror and your body paralyzed as trucks and factory machines move all around you. Someone actually moves a trailer, which you're sure hasn't been moved in years. They drag it into the sun. So you spend the day boiling in a metal box under Arizona's daytime heat. The moment the sun sets, you throw open the door and, even though people are still working, flee into the night. All that matters are the USBs. Are they still good? They're in the satchel, and they look fine. That means you still have a fistful of cash waiting for you at the end of this road. Your only concern is that your satchel is physically falling apart. You move the USBs to an interior pocket and get walking. You never wanted to come back to Tucson. It's been a black spot on your personnel map for years, but here you are. You have to avoid the good neighborhoods. The big stucco houses on their little plots of land, with their raked out front yards and blue recycling bins. For a few moments, a black and white Mustang with a thin blue line Punisher decal on the hood creeps behind you in first gear. You can't tell if it's an actual police car or some kind of patriot group, but you cut through a park where they can't follow. There's a public bathroom there where you might be able to clean up a little. The mirror is cracked and some shit in, someone shit in the urinal, but the water works. You spend a few minutes scraping trash off, then look around for either threats or opportunities. You're so hungry now you keep snarling involuntarily, your lips curling back over white gums. You watch your face in the mirror until you're sure you can control yourself, but you need to feed soon. And though this park bathroom is the perfect place for someone to stumble in and do drugs, no one's around. We're all the junkies. It's not like this is a nice park. And then you re recognize where you are. This abandoned building was the lair of Lampego, a thing of legend that was probably one of the kindred, though no one knows for sure. A shape-shifting monstrosity, destroyed by hunters as the Second Inquisition rose to power and began their dreadful crusade against all vampires. Hmm. She might have been a monster, but there aren't many creatures left like her. Just obedient little kindred without imagination. I wish I could have seen her. The age of wonder is always passing, isn't it? You are mortal. Must you spend eternity in stuffy little rooms trading bon moths with stuffed corpses? Which reminds you, the Elysium awaits. Elysium is one of the defining ideas of the Camarilla. It is a neutral meeting ground where violence and the use of vampire powers are forbidden. In many Elysiums, kindred are allowed to exist as they are, not as the masquerade demands them to be. The Tucson Elysium is located on the roof of a nightclub called the Viper. You can hear the pounding industrial music from the parking lot, but you're not here to party. You've been outside the Viper before. Hold on a second, we need to get some proper ambience for this. Got to do it, you know. Right, you know? We'll have this right now. You can hear the pounding... Oh, okay, it's industrial music. There we go. You've been outside the Viper before, but never in and never up. 
You scan the rooftop and wonder whether to approach first or try to hunt. It's bad form to arrive in Elysium hungry, but hunting nearby is often forbidden since it attracts notice. An eagle settles on a fire escape. You remember the way that eagle looked at you a few nights ago and you suspect it's the way in. You follow it up the fire escape, trying to ignore the hunger that makes your skull pound and your teeth squirm around in your mouth. You don't know what shadow art this place employs, but you reach the top step and the empty looking rooftop of the viper disappears, placed by a sprawling patio covered in cacti and desert shrubs. Footpaths lead through the secret garden, and small stone bridges cross narrow rivulets of cold flowing water. From here, the lights of Tucson are invisible, and the night sky is the way it is deep in the desert, shades of purple and blue and black, with a Milky Way brighter than you've ever seen it. What's up, Dyrock? It's quiet up here, but the music from the nightclub below vibrates through the trash soles of your boots as you cross the flagstones. Your fellow kindred watch you with disgust as your boots leave a crumbly trail of black dirt, but you size them up quickly and dismiss them as quickly. Their weak Camarilla fledgings and neonates, ghouls, dead-eyed mortal servitors, and blood dolls. You scan the crowd for ghouls, living humans fed on vampire blood. They gain immortality and a little power in exchange for slavish devotion. They are vampire's most trusted servant, though they can grow erratic over the years. You think you spot a few, then you look around for someone important. The eagle flies past you and lands beside a young looking man in a linen suit with turquoise jewelry. He's conversing in worried tones with the Nosferatu, a particularly hideous example of the clan whose face is a death's head of grey-black muscles as if her skin has been peeled away. Her monstrous face contrasts with her striking and powerful physique. Your thirst for blood means you are now in a hunger frenzy and cannot think clearly unless you try to feed or focus your willpower. How much willpower do we have? got four willpower. Ew. What do you guys think? I have a feeling that if we try and feed right now in the middle of the club, it's going to lead to some sort of like nasty faux pas. It's going to come back and bite us. Die would feed. Vassaro says burn it. Go. <laughs> yeah, let's go ahead and focus the willpower. We still have we're we're our clan's been shattered, but we're still Tremere. Hmm. They're been on the Tucson Elysium, and I want to know what sort of monsters. I would either I would either clean myself up or examine the kindred. Actually, I think we're just going to go ahead and examine the kindred because it's one of those things that if we if we clean ourselves up, that's fine. But I actually kind of want proof that hey, I just saw something really nasty in the desert. That in case you guys don't know what it is, you know. See what sort of monsters, liars, and sons of bitches we're up against. The simplest way to classify the kindred is by clan. The blonde youth with the turquoise jewelry commands that eagle, an art practiced by only a few clans. And since he's too pretty to be a Nosferatu, you guess he's Clan Gangrel. The Nosferatu with the skinless face is easy to identify, though Nosferatu tells you nothing of her loyalties or nature. But those two are the only ones who are definitely kindred. You feel undead eyes watching you from elsewhere, but you cannot be sure who is here like you. Who is a ghoul, granted long life and cursed with addiction to vampire blood, and who is a mere servitor, their will broken through repeated mental compulsion. As you glance around, the eagle caws, beckoning you. Okay. 
A man in the turquoise jewelry watches your approach with a slight smile. He's seated comfortably in a wicker chair next to a small zinc table with an old laptop, a white hat, and a heap of typed and handwritten correspondence. The Nosferatu, standing beside him, beside him, only scowls. Welcome to Tucson, he says. His accent is foreign, from somewhere in Europe despite the Native American jewelry and the wide-brimmed hat in front of him. I am Prince Leto, and this is Dove, and you are rich, he says. The courier. It looks like you had the difficult journey. A clump of mud falls out of your hair and splats onto the flagstones. Oh, how does it... Give us the data, usurper! The Nosferatu snaps. Dove is wearing a silk screen jacket, kicked around Converse All-Stars, and a snapback with a local minor league baseball team on it. Driving gloves are tucked into her pocket. Another courier? Hmm. Yeah, money first. Money first, sewer rat. Oh, well, hi there. The Nosferatu glares down at you, but the prince seated beside her only laughs, his tone warm and friendly. Will the thousand dollars you're owed be enough to buy you a new ride, wretch? He asks. I'm not sure either of us wants you trapped here. Still, he opens a crocodile skin briefcase, flicks through it, and then hands you a manila envelope. And that's how you make a thousand dollars. You drop the USBs on Prince Leto's table. Leto's laptop is an old Asus, probably intended to read information once before it's destroyed. When the prince inserts the USB, a folder appears with a video and a few text files. A feel free to watch, wretch, Leto says. He checks his Vacheron Constantin. It's 1.49 a.m. Then he looks east. He stares for a long time, as if with longing, then shakes his head. I don't think this interests you directly, but I try not to keep secrets here in Tucson. So I guess he was pr maybe um, Muslim in his mortal life, and... That could have been like one of the times during the day he would pray toward Mecca, looking toward the east. A warm, friendly smile, and eyes that watch you like a... Where did that bird go? The video opens awkwardly, with a hand holding a webcam. You see a man's face, and then you see the ritual chamber. You recognize Jasper, your fellow Tremere from your sire's descriptions, though you've never met him. He's white and apple-cheeked with short gray hair, portly in a way vampires rarely are, like a avuncular college professor. He's wearing a Fair Isle sweater vest and pressed slacks and holding a silver knife with one hand as he tries to adjust the webcam with the other. Uh, oh, that's Jasper Knowles, Tremere Magus, Latou says conversationally. Do you know him? Hmm. Oh, is it our relationships? Doopy doop doo. Relationships. Camarilla relationship. Poor. Excellent. Looking forward to that. I got I got a thousand and three dollars. Hmm. All right. Return to the game. Um. I've never seen him before in my life. Which is true. So there's no reason to make things difficult. Ah. Uh. I'll go for the middle option. I think my sire met him a few times. 
I owe Lato not to misrepresent the truth, though I'm not exposing my sire more than I need to. Lato watches you closely as you answer, tongue against his teeth, concentrating. He thinks you know something, but you've never seen this, Tremere. Dove gasps. Knowles has stepped away from the webcam, revealing a dingy cinder block room with faded orange stripes on the walls and a Nosferatu chained to an iron spike in the floor. The Nosferatu almost killed you the other night. Sire! Dove whispers. Prince Lato's illusion of good cheer falters for a moment. Both he and the eagle glare at Dove. You're here so he can get a read on you, not so his underling can give you information. This experiment has gone on for as long as it can, Null says in the video. Science sometimes ends in failure, my dear, and so does our version of it. No intelligence remains in this specimen and has become increasingly dangerous and aggressive. Uh, once it's destroyed, I'll send what's left to you. I'm also going to wrap up my daytime business. I know that we're still allowed to communicate via email or as or flesh and blood citizens, but my mortal identity is almost 80 years old and soon people will wonder. Something off screen draws Null's attention. He turns the knife, ready to insert it into his wrist. You know enough blood sorcery to recognize that he's planning to attack. Unfortunately for Nulls, he's looking the wrong way. As he stares past the webcam, a figure detaches itself from the shadows of the wall, walks almost casually up to the chain Nosferatu, and removes its shackles. The rest of the video is chaos. The right hurls itself at Nulls. The Tremere screams and fumbles, stumbles into the webcam, which falls. Sorcerous fire blackens the ceiling. Dirty fists rise and fall again and again. Unlike most Tremere, Knowles has mastered the vampiric art of inhuman resilience, but that only makes his destruction longer and more horrible. Then the video suddenly ends. Hmm. What was up with the figure that freed the Nosferatu? Why couldn't I see it clearly? You've never seen those before, Lato says. He sounds frustrated. Aren't you a warlock? I'm a neonate, you remind Prince Lato. The once invincible pyramid of Clan Tremere is now fractured, but you're still at the bottom of what's left. You don't get to talk to important people. All this, and then there's the mess with NVIDIA, Lato mutters under his breath. Well, that's for later. Dove, go back. Who was that shadow? You watch it again, but the shadow is just a blur of formless motion. An impressive disguise, Lato says thoughtfully, freeze-framing on the blur. The assassin doesn't even move it fast at first. There's just nothing there but a smear. Almost as impressive as this rooftop. And what happened to the Nosferatu? Did he escape? He rolls the video back and forth, trying to get a better view. You know the answer to Leto's question, of course. The Eagle Prince's gaze wanders again. He looks east, over the skyline of Tucson. So we gotta be a we gotta be a Tremere right here, and it's true. We share what we know about our encounter with the right. This gets in good with the Camarilla, which might go further than the thousand bucks ever could. So we've got to... Uh, I don't think Wretch would care about people getting hurt. Yeah. And I don't think he cares about the rematch whatsoever. You describe the battle and your narrow escape from the mindless Nosferatu. I'm impressed you're still alive, little neonate, Lato says. The Nosferatu you fought was old and powerful in his time, the child of Ray Ramaus himself. Then his tone hardens and slices through the air like a razor. Dove, your sire is now your responsibility. Find and destroy him. You have seven knights. Watching the video seemed to have taken all the fight out of the Nosferatu. She just nods. You have too many questions. 
most obvious is, why did Prince Leto let you watch the video? Princes are secretive and paranoid creatures, and even in these nights, when the true elders have sunk into torpor or fled to the old world, even a young prince like Leto has survived centuries of betrayal and revolution. Princes don't tolerate risk. That means either Leto or his situation here are unstable, or worse, he already knows you and has accounted for you. Gretch, I have more work for you, the Prince of Tucson says. You will remain here tonight. My man Alexander will provide you with shelter, sustenance, and suitable clothing. And hose you down, obviously. I apologize if he treats you like a horse, but he misses horses. Alexander is a small and sallow man with lank black hair. He wears an oversized gray suit, like a refugee from some 20th century war. He does not smile, which is for the best since you see that his teeth are gray. Oh... Uh... To follow me, Alexander says. His accent is thick and his breath is acidic, like bile. An old ghoul. Kindred grow strange and cold as they age, but old blood slaves are stranger still, and sometimes more dangerous. Let us not pretend to have the strength to go on as you are, Alexander says, opening a door to a glass-walled observation room that overlooks the dance floor of the Viper. EDM makes the windows vibrate. Alexander taps a code into a locked case and takes out a tall flute of, or, tall flute of blood. The Eagle Prince apologizes for this crude repast, but he does not trust new guests around his herd when you are so hungry. And you must... You don't care what else the little man has to say. You seize the blood with both hands and guzzle it, helpless with the hunger, feeling it flow past your lips and down your throat. As the blood sizzles through your veins, you slowly open your eyes, once again in control. Alexander hands you a wet towel, frowning only a little, and you wipe your face. What's our hunger at now? Yay! Our hunger's at four. We need to feed more. After a shower, the servant leads you back to a glass observation room above the club's main dance floor, where a selection of clothing is waiting and you realize that Prince Leto is giving you gifts. That isn't good. You know what happens if you end up in debt to a prince. Please, Alexander says. You must dress for the Elysium. The Eagle Prince insists. You glance at the clothes on display. Leto isn't exactly draping you in Armani, at least. You see a mix of work clothes and streetwear, but nothing too upmarket. You don't see any bloodstains, either. Hmm. So what do you guys think? I'm going to let you all kind of get a uh I want you guys' opinion. Should we go with like a jumpsuit? I don't think we would. Do we want the black leather jacket and engineer boots? Do we need streetwear? Um, office casual? Or the courier's outfit? Suzanne says we need the members only jacket. Yeah, I think I like the streetwear. The streetwear is good for blending in. Office casual. Dyrox says courier. I think we're going to go with street fa streetwear. The courier helps you. Ah, the courier helps you blend in with your role. Yeah, that's true, Dai. Well, we don't have a car right now is kind of the problem. Hmm. If someone stops you, you can say you're delivering something. Hmm. 
Hmm. I'll tell you what. We will let fate decide. I wish this was a D10, but I've got a D20 here. Let's go through for... Uh, one through five for something tough. Six through ten for clubbing. Um, 11 through 15 for professional and then 16 through 20 for the members only jacket. Let's go with this. 19 members only jacket and driving gloves. It is. It's important to look the part. No one wants their semi criminal vampire courier pulling up in a pickle Rick t-shirt and cargo pants. You quickly find cap toe boots and driving gloves in your side size, and then expand from there. Jeans, aloha shirt, and after quite a bit of hunting, a white silk screen jacket with an eagle on the back. Cool. Even if it looks a bit like Lato's eagle. You can find an old suitcase for transporting your cargo, and a knockoff to Sot Heritage 1948 that fits right below your glove. Is it too much? Not yet. You check the pockets of the jacket and find a gold zippo in the shape of a snake and a pair of knockoff Maui Jim, Maui Jim driving sunglasses. Now it's too much. You ascend metal stairs that thump with the base of the EDM below, back up to the rooftop Elysium. Lato's eagle watches you. A gangrel prince is unusual, even in these nights. You wonder where Lato came from, and you wonder what he wants with you. He's still watching the video and reviewing whatever information they got from the other USBs. Dove is scanning the parking lot below. You will be remaining with us for some time, Alexander says. You understand what this means, yes? Of course you understand what will happen if you try to flee. You look toward that parking lot, too. You need a car. We are very friendly people here in Tucson, Alexander says, finally smiling. It's an awful sight. Little gray rat teeth, skin that crinkles like paper. Not like other cities you may know. Speak to people about what you need. Dove was like you once. She drove. You need a car? She has cars. Her retainer, Carlos, is the one listening to the music from below. He is a police officer. He has, you know, rooms, stashes. Of the shit. Is that what he said? What is said? He keeps evidence rooms with the good shit. Maybe you need that sort of man. He is proud and cruel, though. Do not let him bait you. Carlos spots you and Alexander looking at him and gives you the finger. And if you need, hmm, blood, Alexander says, I was a doctor in my youth. When I was young, I said to my teachers, this bleeding, it does not work. It does not make the patients better. Isn't that funny, knowing what I know now? Ah, a little joke. But I have an important job. When kindred feed and kill and endanger the masquerade, I tell Prince Leto. I hate telling him those things. I would prefer if kindred came to me for advice. I will give you this advice now. Do not hunt near the Viper. It is not permitted. And of course, do not use your gifts here. The sudden movement of blood, it upsets Dove. Hmm. Limited choices? Okay. We need blood right now. Well, I don't know. Hmm. 
I don't really care about guns, to tell you the truth. I don't think we have anything in firearms, either. Or com- oh, okay. We have one in combat and nothing in firearms, so there's no reason for us to get a freaking gun. So, I think if we got limited choices, let's go for... Talk to Dove about getting a car and blood. So, let's get blood first. I need blood, Alexander, but I have standards. How are matters arranged here? I know what I am, but I'd rather not be associated with forced extraction pits. Ah, I understand your concerns, Alexander says. I had them too when I was young. But do not fear. If you sin in Tucson, it will be through your own actions. Since you have presented yourself to the prince, you may hunt freely tonight. Not here. A viper is Prince Latos. But I can provide you with good, quiet places. I provide this service, not for your sake, but so you do not embarrass our prince. This is only for tonight, understand? There may have been accidents in Tucson, and the prince will not trust you to wander freely night after night. He rattles off a long list of nightclubs, bars, and halfway homes. His knowledge is encyclopedic, precise, and up-to-date, and his warnings are invaluable. There's some kind of dispute in the parking lot down below. Three women yelling at a guy. Dub gestures, and two heavies head downstairs to sort it out. Hmm. Dyrock, thank you very much for that follow. Let's try and use honey this time with Dove. Because we need a car. It's called Night Road. We need a vehicle. Actually, Vosseros, I'm going to ask you a question real quick. Because I, I do hate when games tend to not take this into account or explain it clearly. Is Are these pretty much the exact same options, just different ways to go about it? About talking to Dove about different accidents and then just talking to her flat out about getting the car. Is it the same thing? You've only done one playthrough. Did you take any of the either of these options? You just talked to her about the cars? The shared interest might be more charisma based. Oh. What's our charisma? Eh, we got three charisma. Let's go. Let's see what happens. Yep. What's our other stuff? Clandestine, intimidation, leadership, persuasion, streetwise. Yeah, let's just go with that. Dove hasn't been exactly polite, but we have a shared interest in cars. I chatter up about different accidents we've been in. So the whole fucking Cadillac is on fire, and I'm kicking and kicking, trying to get the window to break, Dove says. Right, right, because you're trying to follow this story, and it isn't easy. Because I'm still handcuffed to the guy who's pretending to be a werewolf, right? And I'm finally kicking through the window, rip half the dead fake werewolf's arm off to get free. I'm out of my fucking mind now, with all the fire, and I finally crawl out of the car. All right, Dyrock, thank you very much. You have yourself a good night. And get clear before... Before it... Do they blow up? Uh, escalades? Uh, I don't know. Probably not, Dove says. But anyway, I'm finally clear, so I run across the parking lot, laughing because I'm just thrilled not to have met Final Death chained up to that guy. 
and I barely have time to look up before Leto comes screaming around the corner in a Ford Bronco with the lights off and runs me over. I was in the wrong Cadillac the whole time. No. Two black Cadillac Escalades in the parking lot of the Marriott, Dove says. How was I supposed to know which one? Anyway, that's why I don't get to drive anymore. That's why Leto wants assholes like you driving. Driving what? You ask. Because I need a car. Dove shakes her ugly head. I'll get you something. Give me a few hours to work on it and I'll send someone to find you. Two more kindred arrive from the dance floor. Skin slick with other people's sweat, cradling their dazed looking blood dolls. Prince Leto narrows his eyes to this vulgar display but says nothing. We're, we're not doing the flirt option. This isn't uh, Star Wars The Old Republic. So now, do we talk to the prince? Here's the thing. I, we, I think we should either talk to the prince or talk to Carlos about equipment and a place to stay. Because it says we can talk to Carlos about equipment and a place to stay or talk to Carlos because we need guns. So I'm not exactly sure which would be the better option there. What do you guys think? Play. I keep on thinking like we can play politics later. Right now, we kind of need the bare the bare necessities, don't we? I was like, I think we already I think we already had a political victory by not embarrassing ourselves in front of the prince right off the bat and spending that willpower. Samo, talk to Carlos. Yeah, got to get a roof over our head. We've had some rough nights. Carlos is standing on a grate through which he can hear the pounding industrial music below, puffing on an inexpertly rolled joint. You're what, the new courier? Carlos says. The new meat? I guess I am, you say. <laughs> Trash, Carlos says. I'll outlive you, you know. New vampires only last a couple of years. Retainers like us can live forever, especially with Leto in charge. You've already lasted a couple of years, but you're not having this conversation for your health. So you say, I need a place to stay and a new car. Yeah, yeah, me and Miguel and Lana, we'll set it up, Carlos says, waving his hand so blue smoke swirls around it. We'll handle everything. I'll send someone around. Later. Now let me listen. He closes his eyes as the EDM buzzes out of the floor grate. Whatever was happening in the parking lot below was sorted itself out. The heavies are back upstairs, laughing. You memorize their names and faces in case they're trouble later, and circle the Elysium for a few minutes, getting a feel for the place. You can't believe you're back in Tucson. You wonder if anyone recognizes you. Beyond the rooftop, the city lights appear dim and washed out, as if seen through a black veil. Red brake lights from the highway look like a sluggish trail of blood. Just call her. That's Dove, speaking in hushed but anxious tones to Prince Leto. You can't quite hear the rest of the conversation, and the prince's gen or genial smile vanishes. Dove withers at whatever he says next. Then the eagle swings its golden eyes back to you. Ah, Rich, Prince Leto says. I told you I would have work for you. I need to send some emails, and that is not as easy as it once was. Come here. You were still a fledgling when the Second Inquisition burned through the centers of Camarilla Power, places like the Vienna Chantry, your clan's arcane fortress. You weren't important enough to draw the SI's attention. They've been quiet for years. Quiet enough that some kindred are starting to use phones and email to conduct their night work again, cutting into your business. But you know they're fools. The SI was never beaten. The Inquisition is just collecting information now, waiting for an opportunity to strike again. Prince Leto does not want to give them an opportunity. 
You come highly recommended, he says, and I hate to see a proud member of Clan Tremere brought low by circumstances. I need you to run letters to a few cities near Tucson. Don't worry, nothing is more than a single night's trip. <laughs> well, since you're so charming. No. How much? Ah, an interesting question, Prince Lato says. No, it's not Lato, Dove says. Stop pretending you're older than money and pay the man. The Eagle Prince is back to his usual affable self. He laughs, his voice musical, then says... A thousand dollars for the first delivery. More later, based on your performance and how much you've impressed my court. In addition, my man Alexander provides you with vessels, and you may hunt freely in any of the other cities you visit while making your runs. Press Prince Lato. I think the Tremere have always believed that the Camarilla is the best chance for all vampires as long as they run it. So, I think that this... Shame the ones in charge are assholes, but maybe I can work to fix that. I'm in. What's the job? I have to be very careful here and make sure that you click the things before you go through it. Because I actually think I messed up during character creation and went with another thing other than the uh, bail enforcement officer. Prince Lateau hands you a printout marked with three locations and three faces. You recognize one face instantly. It's your sire, Nvidia Call. Your eyes go to the garnet ring on her finger. Three people need to know about the final death of Jasper Knowles and the reduction of Rere Mouse's child to the state of right. He points to each face in turn. Your sire worked closely with Jasper after she escaped New York. She drifted away from him for reasons I don't understand, but she still needs to be informed of his destruction. She also needs to know that, without Jasper Knoll's considerable private wealth funding her, she can no longer sustain her research, and she must return to Tucson. Should we tell him that she'll go crazy when she finds out? Dove asked the prince. I'm sure her child is more familiar than any of us with Dr. Call's mercurial temperament, Prince Leto says. Nonetheless, I will offer my advice. He loves doing that, Dove says. Wretch, I encourage you to deliver my letter and get out. You won't like your sire's reaction when she realizes she's broke. Why can't you keep her... Fu this, is, this would be a question that he'd ask. So, why can't you keep her funded? Sounds like she's doing interesting work. Work I'd like to check out, actually. No money, Dove says with a shrug of her brawny shoulders. That's how the world works, even for blood witches. Lato points to the next face. Pator Muster is one of the rabble, a bruja. He lurks in St. Basil's Hospital in Phoenix, looking after the lost lambs of our flock. Other rabble, the clanless, thin bloods, the mad ones. Maybe even Gangrel. Lato chuckles at his own wit. But he actually keeps them in line, though they are dangerously lax. In fact, I would like you to, um, encourage a bit more tidiness from the kindred at St. Basil's. No open feeding, no drug running, no unauthorized embraces, that sort of thing. This is not a formal mission, you understand. But if you can make our dissatisfaction known... I would appreciate it. But more important, with Knowles gone, the hospital will be up for renovation. Those renovations will compromise St. Basil's usefulness as a haven. I'll write instructions for what Patermaster needs to do. Hmm.
Is there any way to maintain control of the hospital while shaping renovations to our own profit? How ambitious, Dove says with a little laugh. Stick to running messages, kid. The toad glances at his second in command, then continues. And finally, the Ventru Ellen Olive Crona is at the migrant camp in Sierra Blanca, Texas. Oh, Prince Lato says. You may remember her from that excitement a few years ago. Lato is referring to the final death of the old, old Prince of Tucson, a powerful blue blood manipulated into launching a crusade of purification against his clan's old rivals, including the rabble. She has since returned to the Camarilla's good graces, since she provides much of the Southwest with blood, but her operation exists atop a mortal substructure that is profoundly politically unstable. Jasper Knoll's destruction will further destabilize that situation, and she needs to know how. Hmm. A program like Camp Scheffler is good for the long-term stability and survival of vampires. I'm interested in seeing it. Prince Lateau continues as you wonder what kind of program Olive Krona has put together and how it differs from previous similar schemes. Anyway, three deliveries, $1,000 each. And you are welcome to hunt in Tucson in every city you visit for a year after finishing your final delivery, Lateau says. Though you will have to abide by my rules for neonates here in Tucson. My man Alexander will explain once we're finished here. I also give you permission to own property and to create no more than one ghoul. Though you may not embrace new kindred. And take this for emergencies. And only for emergencies. He hands you a prepaid flip phone and a baggie full of, S of SIM cards. Now if you'll excuse me, I must compose the letters you are to deliver. The prince moves to her writing desk under her ramada, leaving the pile of electronic devices and written correspondence, and gets to work composing his messages. You sit down nearby to disable the phone's GPS and get rid of everything that could be used to track you, leaving the device even more stripped down than it began. You glance around at the rooftop Elysium and your thir first thought is, no food. Your hunger is starting to distract you. Later tonight, you'll need to hunt. Hmm. Let's see. Charisma manipulation plus subterfuge. So that would be three. Wits plus investigation and awareness. So three there too. And then manipulation, which is, I think, one of our biggest. But no persuasion. Yeah, three is across the board. Hey, Nova. So... I don't know if that would be... And the only thing that I think he would do is look at the correspondence on the table. Now, that could be... <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm too hungry to risk socializing, and I'm not taking any risk tonight. I hang around to keep my mouth shut until I can leave. You fade into the shadows of the cacti and watch the party. They're more kindred here now than when you first arrived. Not just Dove, but another Nosferatu unrelated to Ray Ramos, an ecstatic looking Toreador dripping with other people's sweat from the dance floor. Prince Lato's Malkavian Oracle, and a few scummy looking Ventru in $3,000 suits, because this is the Camarilla and they come with the furniture. Lato has a small army of blood slaves, but you learn from whispered gossip that none has proven worthy of the embrace. But other than asking a few careful questions, you remain quiet, watching and listening. The kindred here keep disappearing downstairs, but you're sure you're not allowed to feed in the Elysium. Your palms itch. You can't stay here. 
You need to see what this city has to offer. As if sensing your mood, Alexander returns, his approach heralded by his reeking breath. I have spoken with the prince, and he has given you permission to feed in the city tonight, he says. After that, you must speak with me about arrangements. Tucson can be a difficult city, and you do not yet have a ride. For clubs, stay away from the country and western places. We all love, uh, what is it called? A jamboree, right here in America? But they are claimed by others. And do not feed from the sleeping. The ventru of Prince Leto's court must feed that way. And do not want competition. Otherwise, your needs can be met just north of here. There are clubs and alleys, drunks and prostitutes, even veterinarian clinics and hospitals. You will be watched, of course. Do not dishonor the prince. You lean over the edge of the railing, looking down on Tucson. For years, you've taken blood wherever you could, usually as payment for a job, but most vampires your age hunt, and most of them specialize. Before you became a courier, you too had a specialty. You think back to those years with NVIDIA Call before you drove the night roads to perpetuate your existence. You try to remember the skills you developed to feed. Hmm. Beggars and vagrants. During sex, on animals, blood bags, the sleeping, and people in the scene. Hmm. What do you guys think? Scene or sex? Oh no, I understand Vosseros. I'm just like you get people's opinions on it. What would it be based on the stats? <laughs> Investigation streetwise. This does do a stat boost. Oh, I see. So I'm sure sex would actually... I'm trying not to, like, power game it, obviously, if you saw any of the stats. <laughs> it's definitely a thing. Uh, the scene would probably... I think he would do the scene more than anything. Let's go with that. Before you embrace the kindred hid in and maintained, a complex, overlapping counterculture of musicians, artists, political philosophers, and cultural hangers-on, this was a deliberate artifice, a counterculture of convenience used by the undead to hide their activities. Various occult, spiritual, romantic, and bohemian movements fulfilled similar functions in previous decades, aka the herd background. But the world is more diffused now without much of a mainstream culture for a counterculture to react to. By the time you joined the ranks of the undead, the old counterculture's vitality had bled into indie rock, steampunk fashion, and a dozen other places. But goth isn't dead. Not where the kindred walk. You return to where you got your silkscreen jacket and grab everything cheap and black that Alexander won't miss. You can mix and match on your way there. Even half disabled to prevent tracking, your cheap flip phone turns up a dozen hits for goth club around Tucson. You walk to the nearest one. Peter Murphy's strange kind of love hits you like a wall of hammers as you enter. The music hasn't changed, but you think the bass technology has gotten better. Feels like your eyeballs are jiggling. It, it's about... One kid is trying to shout to another over the music, right next to your ear. It's about Gorilla Grodd's romance to Monsieur Mala. But I said it's about Gorilla... This will not do. 
You cross the dance floor and find a quiet corner against the poster-encrusted wall where you can sit, order a drink you won't touch, and contemplate your next move. You're not here for sex, but the hunt is an aesthetic experience for you nonetheless. Tonight it'll be... Woman! Woman! She's either a girl or just very pretty. Either way, she smiles at you and walks your way, her white hair streaming behind her. Her black t-shirt reads, Superhuman Strength and Reflexes, Genius Level Intellect, Use of Guns. Do you dance? She asks. No, you say. She smiles and sits down, and you know you found tonight's meal. Away from the thrumming bass, you're able to talk, or rather to listen. Your appearance has already captivated her. Maybe she used to be a blood doll. There's a hardness around her eyes, despite her youth, that speaks of loss and betrayal, but people don't need a vampire to make them look like that. Maybe she just wants to do something stupid or to get hurt. You can offer both. You make your offer. She smiles and waves you back into a hallway with padded black walls. There's no one here except the two of you and a black light. So, she says, laughing a little nervously. How do we do this? You sink your fangs into her neck. She writhes for a moment, terrified, and you can feel that she's never been kissed before. But you don't stop. Then you realize that you can't stop. It's been too long, and your beast is too strong. Your prey's hands run through your hair, then beat on your shoulders trying to pull you off. You shove her against the padded wall and drink your fill. Any other night, and you'd be disposing of a corpse. But just before you lose yourself in the ecstasy of the kiss, the door farther down the corridor bangs. You rip your fangs out of her throat, but no one's there. Still, the urge passes. You're in control again. Sated. You lick her throat and the puncture wounds vanish. She slowly slides down the wall. Shit. She's lost a lot of blood, and you don't want to leave a corpse your first night in Tucson. You feel around in the darkness for her purse, call 911, leave it to ring, and walk away. It won't always be that easy, you think as you sit on a park bench, sluggishly moving your stolen blood around your body. New vampires can always have fun for the first few nights, but then other kindred learn about your tricks, or hunters start noticing statistical anomalies where the herd itself instinctively reacts to the invisible predator in their midst. But tonight, you feel good. A Lotus Suspira Turbo in powder blue rolls up to the curb, blaring synthwave loud enough to scare the crows. The driver flings a parcel your way. When you pick it up, he peels out. The parcel contains a card for a pawn shop. Written on the back, cars. There's also an extended stay ticket for a parking garage with a four-digit key code written on the back. So it looks like you have a place to park. Um, how's our hunger? Hey, our hunger's at one. Good. Uh, you can never, if I recall correctly, your hunger can never, like, completely disappear. It always stays at one. The beast is always there. It's a, it's probably the, one of the biggest differences between, um, third edition and fifth edition. A fourth edition was completely different, but um, yeah, instead of instead of having to keep track of your blood points like a gas tank almost in third edition, you you always have that hunger, and it can be completely random when it decides to just <coughs> take you. All right, so let's see. We did get a our mighty four of intelligence. Haha. -ha! Intimidation, leadership, persuasion. Streetwise. Academics. This looks like a typical Tremere. I would think, all things considered. Respect the traditions. Perpetuate your existence. Mighty Humanity of Four. We have one Masquerade violation? What? What? Oh, well. Even after midnight, it feels dangerous to run across the wide, palm-lined, tree-lined boulevard that leads to your destination. 
You need a car. You're itching like earlier when you needed blood, only now the need is to move fast. Stop fighting the shape of this city and start flowing through it the way it wants you to. By the end of tonight, you either need to buy a car or learn how to turn into a bat because Tucson is no place for pedestrians. Covenant Pawn Shop is wedged between an auto repair shop and a nail salon. Whoops. There we go. Across from a title max. Signs read, cash for guns, we buy gold, and closed. You step into the sad, dusty, spiritual void of the pawn shop. I like that background. You pass PS4 games, bedazzled purses, a glass case full of rings, regalio perfecto, and enough rifles to conquer Belgium. The first thing you do is stock up on a few necessities of your trade. A few duffel bags and rucksacks, a mini crowbar, a small folding knife. Actually, we're not in the club anymore, so we need to... Go back to the normal ambiance. There we go. Uh, a few duffel bags and rucksacks, a mini crowbar, a small folding knife, a folding shovel, a hacksaw, some lockpicks, matches, cord, electrician's tape, a flashlight, a blood and tissue kit with extra syringes, spare USBs, and a portable toolkit. Um, no duct tape actually concerns me a bit. You stop at the knives because you recognize the silver knife in one display case. Jasper Knowles was holding it before he was killed. Or maybe it's just a knockoff of some movie prop or something. You can't be sure, but... That's weird. Ooh. Behind the display case with the knives is a pretty young woman with choppy blonde hair and Victorian replica railway glasses. She's peered over those sunglasses to watch you like a hawk since you pushed past the clothes sign and walked in. You know that reaction. She recognizes a predator, but doesn't know exactly what kind. So this place is only tangentially connected to the Tucson Camarilla. It and she are independent and kept that way because they're useful. When you get closer, the young woman leans closer, studying your courier's outfit. Her bare arms are covered in H.R. Giger tattoos, which, yes, that is Giger's work right there. Nice. Sinuous biomechanical figures in shades of black, gray, and green. Finally, she says, Miguel Senor. It's not quite a question and not quite a statement. Miguel and Carlos know each other, but you don't know the details. You did ask the Prince's Second Command Dove about getting something to drive. Whatever. You nod. Call me Elena. Let's get you set up. She throws a red leather jacket on over her tattoos. She makes sure you can see the clock in the shoulder holster. The cars are waiting out back. A rusted chain link fence divides Covenant Pawn Shop's parking lot from a row of rusted Quonset huts. The huts, and the slightly taller buildings on either side, serve to hide a full parking lot of parked cars that probably shouldn't be here. Miguel says you need wheels, Alana says. She steps into the shadows and starts messing around on her phone, but she keeps her eyes on you above the railway glasses. These cars are shit. Miguel either hates your guts or doesn't care if your mission for Prince Leto succeeds or fails. You instantly dismiss the vans, economy cars, and anything covered in rust or that would require more cash to repair than buy. That leaves you with four mediocre specimens. A Mitsubishi 3000 GT with too many aftermarket mods, a little Honda S2000 with electronic problems, an ancient but still rolling BMW 3 Series, and an ugly but functional Nissan Frontier. This stuff inside is 20% off, Elena says. Tonight only. Miguel must like you, or hey me. She props the door back open. Wealth, $903. Hmm. So another thing where we have, um... <laughs> As one of the immortal undead, I obviously need a sword. I want that, I want to go get that, uh... Yes. We need, to, we need to find out about that knife. So 
So maybe one of the last things that we can do here, we've got a little bit of time, is let's see what our options are here. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and we're going to go to Google image search. And it's a Mitsubishi GT. Okay, that's not horrible. With too many aftermarket mods. Hmm. So let me go ahead and, and uh, show you guys kind of what we're we're looking at here. Can I go this? It's probably going to cover the screen. Just one sec. This isn't how I prefer to uh, show these, but um, one sec. All right. So these right here, that is the, uh, that's the GT. So it's not bad. It's a little, it's basically a little sports car with a lot of like wannabe Fast and Furious mods. Um... Honda S2000. And that's a big negative because that is a canvas top right there. Was it the same on the... At least that one was enclosed. But it's got that back roof, which I'm not... I definitely would like that over this one. Vampires and convertibles very rarely. Yeah, no trunk space either. That's important. Uh, BMW 3. Okay, this one, this one looks, this one looks more Tremere. Hmm. So we've got, this one's nice, it's old though, but it's got trunk space, it's still running, which means it's reliable. It's just old, much like ourselves. So, I like that one. And a Nissan Frontier. Oh! Canyon Arrow! We can even upgrade them? Holy crap. This is like a full VTM campaign. I love it. So, yeah. We can get ourselves a truck right now, but no trunk. Yeah. I agree. Unless it comes with a cover, which I, I kind of doubt. I think that BMW is kind of what we should be hunting for. What do you guys think? I think that'll work out the most for us. That seems to be the most functional car for vampiric shenanigans. Just take them for a test drive, says Vasaros. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, guys, um, before we take any of these cars out for a spin, I think that's actually going to be, this is your time to check all the things. Yeah. Let me go ahead and see the, the rest of the stats here real quick. How's our relationships going? We got up, we went up a dot. Our relationship is poor with the Camarilla. So that's something. Is our inventory in good shape too? 
I love the fact that it's a hacked Kindle Paperwhite loaded with blood sorcery grimoires. Makes me happy. Yeah, will we get a lemon? Will he flirt with the cute lady? Find out next week. Yeah, um, I think this is a great place to end it, actually. We're here in the pawn shop. We're going to look and see what kind of car that we want to get. We're going to get ourselves stocked up. And uh, we're fed. We do have a masquerade breach, which is unfortunate. But uh, we got two more strikes. We'll uh, see what happens. But um, yeah, I hope you guys have enjoyed the first thing. I'm going to be doing this every Friday night for about two hours or so. Um, this is going to be on YouTube, so people can watch this. I'd never let the YouTube audience down when it comes to this kind of stuff. So yeah, um, we will go ahead and... Are you guys liking it so far? <laughs> because I do agree with Phosphoros, it is has a lot of depth to it. So, Kyle Marquis, you know, good stuff. Yeah, this is one of those things. They're wetting our appetite so much for Bloodlines 2. Um, when Bloodlines 2, uh, everyone thought when Coteries of New York came out, it was like, all right, so this is the thing that's going to kind of wet our appetite before Bloodlines 2 came out. And then, oh God, like we've got, we had Coteries of New York. We have Shadows of New York. We've got this. We've got the expansions for it. Um, there's like two more VTM games down the line. There's a Werewolf the Apocalypse game. There's Bloodlines 2. It's just so much stuff coming down the line. The poor vampire Lilani is actually what most people play as for their first characters in VTM, believe it or not. Um, I know that unless you're a Ventru or have a really good storyline reason for being rich at character creation, you you basically no different than you know, a uh, human working nine to five and they just have to, they have to build up their status. You know, it's not, not, not like it was in the dark ages when you can just kill everyone in a castle and take it as your own. So yeah. And Vosseros beat the entire thing in one night, but we're going to go ahead and spend it out just a little bit. Cause I'm actually wanting to make, um, Fridays my, uh, the tabletop RPG day. And that'll, I'll go more into detail with that once we finish this up. And journal tells you about stats. Let's see. Journal. Did I press the wrong button? Yes, yeah, so I do. Show stats. Journal, journal, journal. Characters, clan. Oh, wow. Functions of abilities, nature of the blood, the beckoning, the second inquisition. So if you have no idea what's going on, here is everything. So that's cool. I like it. We got Kyle, Dove, Alana. Uh, sometimes, it just depends. Like the Kindred and, and White Wolf stuff. None of the thing about it is archetypes do not really, or stereotypes don't really exist in the world of darkness. In some, I mean, in terms of like vampires, like some of them can be poor some of them can be rich it just really depends on where they are and circumstances it's one of the reasons i like it so much all right guys so um we will pick this up next week if you guys haven't followed the twitch channel please do so i try and stream on mondays wednesdays and fridays during the weekends and random times in between and if you're watching the replay of this on youtube uh, this will be a weekly series and um it'll be posted on saturdays and, um, you know, I have a link to the Twitch channel in the description below, as well as a link to my Extra Life page, where I'm raising money for my local Children's Miracle Network Hospital via the amazing Extra Life charity. So please check those links out if you feel so inclined. Um, like, share, subscribe. You guys know the drill there. And we will see you next time. Later days, everyone.